morning, Columbia, and we hope Winston appreciated the fight song from his alma mater, Florida State. Good morning from Columbia. I can't think of a better way to start the day than hearing the, uh, the Florida State fight song. I say good morning to everybody, and go Nose. How was your Thanksgiving? It was great. We had a lot to be thankful for. Uh, a very successful mission for the most part, especially uh, the capture. And, of course, we did have our traditional uh, turkey uh, dinner. Talking about the capture, wrestling a satellite seems to the layman on Earth to be such a simple thing in, in zero gravity, but uh, it's really a complicated procedure there to, uh, to grab something even in a weightless environment. Well, there's no doubt about that. It's not a trivial event. That satellite is several thousand pounds. Uh, it weighs as much as most automobiles. And the uh, spacesuits themselves, of course, are very bulky. So not only do you have to fight the suit, but you've got to uh, be very careful as to how you handle that massive uh, satellite. It could go out of control on you, and uh, it, it's certainly not a trivial event. Well, I was glad it was a success there. Uh, Commander, you're flying on the oldest American spacecraft that's still flying, the 24th mission of uh, Columbia, first launch back in 1981. This is kind of a testament to the reliability of that spacecraft, isn't it? Well, Columbia is the grand dame of the, the fleet, and she is really uh, flying flawlessly. Uh, the folks at Kennedy Space Center have uh, processed her and uh, turned her around, gave us a really clean bird, and she's doing just fine. Now, you on board have a, an experiment from Phillips Laboratories here in Albuquerque, the sodium sulfur battery flight experiment. Can you tell us what it is and how it's going? Yes, the, uh, the NASB, as we call it, a sodium sulfur battery experiment. You're right, it is in the payload bay. And uh, it's an experiment that, that is uh, testing how well a different type of battery using sodium and sulfur is going to work. The potential payoff of that is that it's about three times the uh, electrical energy that we can get from a comparable battery of that size using traditional chemicals. The uh, NASB has been working real well. It went through its startup procedure, its heat-up procedure. We've had a couple of uh, charging cycles, a couple of discharge cycles, and thus far it's working real well. It has uh, great potential for use on the space station. Captain Scott, I'm sure the folks at Phillips will be glad to hear that. Uh, Dr. Takao Doi, uh, you were the first Japanese astronaut to walk in space, and obviously this was a, uh, an incredible event for you and your country. Uh, what was it like to actually float outside the spacecraft? It was uh, a wonderful experience. I was very excited about just being out there, uh, coming out of the shuttle. And uh, this time, uh, we... Uh, we captured the sunlight, and it was uh, also spectacular. So I, I'm really happy that uh, we could uh, uh, have this kind of great uh, experience. Of course, there's a lot of kids out there who are watching, and space flight is such a fascinating thing for kids of all ages. What would your recommendations be to kids out there on what they should focus on if they want to uh, study to be an astronaut? What should be the uh, top subjects that they should be studying in school? Well, um, since I was a kid, uh, I uh, I liked watching stars, and just I uh, I have been pursuing uh, watching stars and studying the universe. And my dream is has been just uh, exploring the universe and know about them, uh, more about the space. I I'm just uh, pursuing my dream. But the most important thing I can tell to uh, many uh, many young people is that uh, just. Uh, uh, have your own dream and pursue it. And this is a microgravity experiment. Very quickly, could you explain what that is all about? Uh, right now, uh, we are conducting uh, the material science experiments uh, um, both uh, in the mid-deck and uh, in the payload bay. Uh, especially today, we are going to conduct a combustion experience, uh, a so-called L enclosed laminar flame experiment. Also, uh, outside, uh, in the Pearl Bay, uh, we are uh, conducting uh, uh, many uh, crystal growth experiments, which may uh, give us uh, very high-quality uh, crystals, uh, which can be used for um, the computers and many other electronics materials. I understand there may
making the decision on Monday whether or not to uh, let Spartan free again, but some of the wire stories we're hearing is that the space shuttle is going to have to back up 30 or 40 miles to give it some room to, to do its thing. Uh, what is that all about? Can you explain that simply to us? Well, very simply, uh, when we release the satellite, we go into what a station keep mode is. And we just should use normal orbital mechanics to let us drift slowly 30, 40 miles away. And that gets us in a position where we won't conflict in subsequent orbits with the Spartan. And also, we're close enough that when it's time to retrieve it, we can do that in a very efficient manner. I uh, did a story just uh, this week in Palmdale where they're refurbishing another uh, space shuttle Atlantis. And I, I think I know where you guys are right now. I think you're at the flight deck, if I'm not sure. Can you just tell me where you are and show me something behind you and give us a little quick tour? Sure. We are on the, the flight deck. Right behind Winston uh, is uh, the pilot's seat where Steve Lindsay sits, uh, where uh, Takao is, is the center console, uh, and that is uh, looking right at the, the flight deck, and the commander seat's off to the left. Uh, back out uh, to the aft here is our two windows where we can see out through the tail, and we happen to be belly to the earth, but we can look down right through these overhead windows and look out and see the Earth, and we're passing over the Pacific Ocean at this time. Uh, Captain Scott, one of the things that I noticed was how cramped the quarters are in there. Can you tell me a little bit about how weightlessness makes it not quite as cramped as it would be for us on Earth? Well, as you, as you can imagine, weightlessness does just that, because not only do you use the normal space that you'd use on Earth, but you'd use all the space in the overhead. When we translate, for example, it's very easy to just go over a crew member's head or go uh, float along the floor around a crew member's feet. We really do use all, uh, all of the volume available to us and not just a portion that we would use on Earth. How do you sleep? What position? In this, on this particular flight, we have sleep stations, and uh, the sleep stations are horizontally oriented uh, compartments Inside those sleep stations are sleeping bags. We sort of strap ourselves in the sleeping bags to keep from floating away, and we literally drift about inside those sleeping bags. On missions with no sleep stations, each crew member will strap his or her sleeping bag wherever they want it, and they sleep that way. You can sleep upside down, sideways, backwards, forwards. There is no up or down in space. It feels strange at first, but when you get used to it, it's kind of fun. That's great. Uh, mission specialist Doy, um I know that you train a lot before you actually go up and you know what to expect, but what was the most surprising thing once you actually went on the mission and, and the thing that, you, that went as planned, I guess? The, the, the most uh, the spectacular experience uh, was the EBA, and uh, especially uh, we are trained to do uh, uh, some evaluation and the verification test for the, the space station. Uh, tools and the equipment, but this time uh, we uh, happened to uh, to capture Earth and satellite, and it was uh, um, just amazing experience. I have just a little time left. I'd like to go back to Commander Craigle just for a second, if I could. Commander, I know you guys can't be possibly working 24 hours a day. Is there any free time at all? And if so, what do you guys do with your free time up there? Uh, we work fairly hard, but we do get uh, free time from time to time. And the number one pastime for everyone is to look out the window. Uh, you can exercise and you can read a book, but you can do that on Earth. Uh, you can't look out the, the window and get such a spectacular view any place but here. So I think that's the uh, pastime of choice. Is it hard not to think of... Um philosophy and religion and all those kinds of things, I guess, when you're in a position to where you folks are? I would say it's a very humbling uh, position, and I think all folks get very introspective when they're up here and just looking at this magnificent blue planet uh, go beneath us. Uh, and folks down here on Earth were uh, watching with great interest when two of you grabbed that Aaron satellite, not quite with your bare hands, but close enough, I guess. Captain Scott, you told reporters last Saturday night you believe this could be done, even though I understand it's been like five years since the last time somebody tried this sort of thing. What was behind your confidence? Were there skeptics down in this mission control? Well, I'll tell you, the thing that was behind my confidence is the fantastic teamwork that uh, the NASA folks on the ground uh, provide for us. 
We had astronauts in our neutral buoyancy lab uh, looking at this procedure and testing it. We had folks over in the uh, virtual reality laboratory looking at it. We were conferring back and forth. Uh, a lot of heads went together on these plans, and, and that really was the thing that uh, boosted my confidence. Well, Captain Scott, you've made a number of uh, spacewalks before, I know. How, how did they prepare you for this particular maneuver, if you're grabbing a satellite? Well, of course, you, you know, you can't uh, predict every single maneuver that's going to happen. We train the best we can. We had practiced for grabbing a satellite, but never grabbing one that was rotating in this fashion. And again, we, uh, we, we looked at the events as they occurred, made the best decisions that we could, and fortunately everything worked out real well for us. And like a, a giant spiraling football, is that right? <laughs> Trying to catch that. Dr. Doi, uh, now you work for Japan's NASDA. Is, is Japan working toward its own independent uh, space program? Uh, right now, uh, we are working very closely with uh, uh, the United States, especially uh, we are having this space shuttle program so that I am uh, right now here. Also, uh, Japan is working on the space station program and we'll have a uh, uh, Japanese experiment module uh, in, a, in about a uh, couple of years. Let me move on to Commander Kriegel. Working with an international crew is certainly nothing new for you, is it? No, it certainly isn't. We've got a lot of international folks in the office, and my last mission, I was fortunate enough to work with a freshman, Jean-Jacques Favier, a Canadian, Bob Thurs, and the two backups, Pedro Duque from Spain, and Luca Urbani from Italy. Commander Kriegel, in what ways uh, is your experience in space enriched by an international crew, and, and in what ways is it complicated? Well, I don't think it's complicated at all. It's uh, just some challenges, uh, learning the different cultures and, and getting a common language. Uh, but I think it's enriched as we bring the different cultures together, uh, because when you bring different cultures and you know each other, uh, a lot of this distress goes away and a lot of harmony comes out of it. So I think working in an international uh, crew really shows the way of how the world should be in the future. Gentlemen, I, I guess this is a question for, for all or any of you. Uh, when, when did you first know you wanted to be in outer space? Well, I'll uh, pass it along. Uh, I knew this is what I wanted to do when I uh, saw the folks during the uh, Mercury, the Gemini, and the Apollo years. It said uh, guys were walking on the moon and exploring the, the universe. I said, that's something I'd like to do. I'd like to go uh, to the moon or the Mars and beyond. Uh, when I was a child growing up watching the Mercury program, it was something that was very fascinating to me, and I thought I would like to do it, but I, I never had any inkling that it would come true for me. Fortunately, things did work out well, and uh, I am here. And in addition to that, I like to, to say that if I can be an image or a role model to other minorities who might be interested in the program, then I certainly take that responsibility very seriously. But, yeah, I'm very happy to be a part of the program. When I was uh, 14 years old, I started watching stars, and at that time, the Apollo 11 just landed on the moon. Uh, since then, just uh, I wanted to uh, to explore 